Okay. So we'll get rolling with section 15 of EPIC. So thanks everyone for being here for this. Uh, we're moving into a new time period, which if you have your nifty Bible timeline charts, uh, you'll see is the Catholic Reformation. It's a gold period. And we'll talk a little bit about that and, and why it's a gold period. Uh, we just moved from the protesters and the defenders period in orange time period, uh, which was 1500 to 1544. The time period we're covering now for this session and the next one is 1545 to 1699, so about 150 years. Uh, and what we'll see during this time period really is a response to what happened in the protesters and the defenders time period. And uh, we saw during the last lesson, uh, we saw some of the uh, results of the bad leadership during the, uh, or as a result of the weak leaders in schism time period. Uh, that was a black time period. It really caused people such as Calvin and Luther to stand up and revolt against things they saw. And some of it, some of the ideas were founded on perhaps, um, you know, good motives, but bad actions. Some of it was uh, bad theology, but the end result was we saw a split in the church. We saw Calvin uh, taking a lot of people away from the Catholic faith. Uh, we saw uh, we saw what Luther had done in the previous lesson and taking people away from the faith there. And then ultimately we saw in England uh, King Henry VIII taking people away from the faith there. Uh, there were some good points though. We saw Our Lady of Guadalupe. That was an important point for um, people in Mexico for conversions there. So a lot of interesting things that went on. Now we're going to see the Catholic Reformation, basically the response to what went on in the last time period uh, by the Catholic Church. And so um, we're going to start off seeing uh, what goes on in England. We're going to see them continue to go into uh, decline away from the Catholic faith. but. We will also see other areas of, of the church and of the world uh, kind of come back. And so we'll see, uh, see that in this lesson in the next. But uh, we can go ahead and begin in prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here again today. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and open our minds to how you would lead us to the knowledge that we can gain and help us to grow closer to you as we learn more about your church. We're so grateful for the opportunity to live in this country and to enjoy the freedoms that we have. And we ask that you would help us to learn more about those who have come before us, who have given us the gift of your church, so that we may bring that gift to others. We thank you, Lord, for all of our family and friends, and we ask your blessings upon all of them. Please, Lord, help us to continue to travel on the path that you have set forth for us and help us to be the best Christians and servants we can be. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. So, uh, any questions or comments about the last lesson or anything else? Oh, there they sell indulgences. <laughs> yeah, the indulgences. Uh, unfortunately, the bad theology mixed with the motivation for um, building, for funding St. Peter's Cathedral, St. Peter's, Peter's Basilica caused a, a great problem. And so that was something that was one of Luther's uh, main arguments. And, you know, so it, it definitely one of the negative aspects of church history. Uh, people who took advantage of Catholic theology and twisted it in a way that allowed them to fund their own desires, but to do it in a way that drove people away from the faith. So, for sure. Um, so we can go into the the reading, the establish the context section for session 15, and I'm on page 81 of my book, and so I'll read through this, and we can kind of go over what we'll be talking about in just a second.
England has been led into schism by the selfish and lustful desires of her monarch. The slope from schism to heresy is a slippery one and traveled by many throughout the history of the church, and England is no different. England slides further from Rome as Archbishop Cranmer, the architect of English Protestantism, controls Henry's son, the young and sickly Edward VI. Cranmer, an indecisive man guided by political maneuverings, completes the break with Rome by abolishing the Mass and substituting a new liturgy of his own creation, with help and advice from John Calvin. It is now illegal to attend the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass on the once proud and fiercely Catholic island. Cranmer ensures that the separation from Rome is complete by changing the ritual for ordaining priests, removing all mention of and understanding of the sacrificial nature of the priesthood, thus breaking the chain of apostolic succession and invalidating English orders in the future. <coughs> but all is not lost. There is hope, although just a glimmer. Edward dies and appoints Lady Jane Grey as his successor. Unpopular, she is removed from power after only nine days, and the crown is given to Mary Tudor, Henry and Catherine saw her. <coughs> Mary firmly believes that God has given her the throne in order to restore the true faith to England. This is her determined and overarching focus throughout her brief five-year reign. She accomplishes this divine mandate, bringing the faith back to England. However, there is a problem. Mary is 37 years old, unmarried, and without an heir. If she were to die, Without an heir, the crown would pass to her Protestant half-sister, Elizabeth, and England would once again slip into schism and heresy. A marriage was desperately needed, and the Holy Roman Emperor proposed the perfect solution. Charles V suggested his son, Prince Philip of Spain, to be Mary's husband. Mary agrees, but the English people do not welcome the possibility of Spanish influence on their nation. Philip dislikes England, and is not overly fond of Mary, despite her love for him. He leaves England without providing England with a Catholic heir to attend to matters in Spain. Mary's reign is marked by the execution of Protestant rebels who threaten the existence of her rule. These executions would earn Mary the moniker Bloody Mary, despite the fact that the number affected pale in comparison to her better known half-sister, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's 45-year reign, although tenuous at first, is motivated by a desire to eradicate the Catholic faith and to make England a world power. Through her trusted advisors, Elizabeth is able to accomplish both. <clears throat> Attending Mass, assisting Jesuits and other priests, and holding to the Catholic faith are declared to be treasonous activities punishable by death. Not since Rome was there an empire where Catholics were persecuted in such numbers by the state. Despite these restrictions, the faith survived in England through the brave missionary efforts of Jesuits and other priests, the heroic actions of ordinary English men and women, and the blood of the martyrs. The effects of the Protestant Revolution were felt throughout Europe as violence and warfare spread throughout the continent. Scotland became Protestant through the actions of John Knox. French Protestants threatened the monarchy and launched a series of civil wars over 35 years that almost resulted in the faith's demise. Rebellion against the Spanish crown and the Catholic Church dominated events in the Netherlands. Germany, birthplace of the revolution, was mired in bloody conflicts for over 100 years. Europe was in turmoil, the Church was in turmoil, and in need of reform. Reform finally came through one of the most important councils in Church history, the Council of Trent. Meeting sporadically over 18 years, the Council gave the Church a doctrinally firm foundation and produced a, ref a reformation of clerical life. The decrees of Trent would be implemented by a saintly pope, a new religious order, and the actions of holy mystics, missionaries, and martyrs. The Catholic Reformation allowed the Church to purify and prepare herself for the troubled centuries ahead. Alright, so we can go ahead and begin our lesson. And just as a side note, there is a quick review. Um, I will record that at home and I will post that on the website. So we don't have time for it in a lesson, obviously, but it's something I want to put out there in case you want to review quickly. So, sure.
journey through church history as we take the next or 20 sessions to study the history of the church. I want to thank you and the audience for being here with us today. Also those listening uh, on the audio and watching the DVDs at home or in your parish. Before we begin this session on the Catholic Reformation, where we look at how the church authentically reformed herself in response to the Protestant Revolution, which we looked at in our last time period, let's take a moment in prayer and offer our prayers up to our Heavenly Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we give Thee thanks, honor, glory, and praise for the holy gift of Your Church. We thank You also, Lord, for the gift of the many holy saints that You brought to the Church during this period of Church history. These saints who helped to reform Your Church when she was in desperate need of reform. We pray, Lord, that we may look to their example and that we may uh, have the same faith, the same courage to defend our church and to learn and to study the history of our church so that we can defend her during our modern age. We pray these things, we pray all things in Jesus' name as we pray together to our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So in our last session, we finished up our story on the Protestant Revolution. We were in the time period of protesters and defenders. And we finished with our story of England and how we saw the whims of one man, King Henry VIII, takes the church... Uh, it takes England away from the church founded or centered on the Holy Father in Rome. And we saw, too, how before that, in our, the session before that, we looked at Martin Luther and how he began the Protestant revolt and really gave voice to the revolution. And then we had John Calvin who organized and systematized Protestant theology. And we saw that one of the reasons why the Protestant revolution began was because of the state of the church leading or back to our previous time period, two time periods ago, of weak leaders and schism, and how we had a series of bad popes who were weak leaders and did not lead the church strongly when she needed strong leaders, did not reform the church when she needed to be reformed from some of the abuses that had crept into the church, abuses like simony, the buying and selling of ecclesiastical offices, different abuses like nepotism or absenteeism when men bishops didn't live in their diocese and all of this began to weaken the structure of the church that needs you know the church needs that strong leadership structure to guide it as we've seen throughout history and whenever that structure has been weak or weak men rather have been in that structure there have been devastating consequences not only to the church but also to western civilization and so we've seen how the church has, been, has needed to be reformed over these last several centuries. And although there were some attempts made to do that, there were people who were within, stayed within the church and tried to, to rally the church to reform herself, none of these really came to any fruition. None of the fruits, no fruit really came from all those efforts. But now in this time period of the Catholic Reformation, from the year 1545 up to 1699, we see the church engage heavily in a reform of herself, and the reform is led primarily through the efforts of holy saints that we'll study this session and next. And so we've taken the color gold for this time period of the Catholic Reformation to help us remember that it, it was those saints, were those saints who, those holy saints who led the church on this authentic reform and brought many Catholics or many Christians in Europe back to the faith and placed the church on a firm foundation for the next time period that we'll discuss revolutions in modernism when the church is under attack throughout Western Europe. And so the church undertakes authentic reform during this period of time, and authentic reform is centered on what we call the three D's, the three D's of doctrine, discipline, and devotion. This is how the reform will come about. The church will look at her doctrine. She will reiterate the constant teachings of her constant teachings for the last 2,000 years. She will make those teachings more accessible. She will promulgate them so that people will be able to know them more firmly, again, in response to the Protestant, some of the Protestant teachings and the Protestant revolt. There will be a new fervor in worship, so we'll center on the second D of devotion. We'll see one holy, great pope reform the liturgy 
so that the church will be centered on an authentic worship, and that worship will then help guide the, the authentic Reformation. Then the third D is discipline. The church will undergo a series, will review basically herself and the life of her bishops and priests, and will enact certain discipline measures that will hope, will ensure that the immorality that we saw in the past, the weak leadership that we saw in the past, that that will never come again. Although, again, you know, the church is comprised of human beings, fallen yet redeemed creatures, so even the best disciplinary measures put in place may not always work. But these discipline measures that are placed in the church here during this, this 16th century really serve as a great bulwark for future abuse and future problems. So the church's reform centered on those three Ds, doctrine, discipline, and devotion. And we'll take a look at each one of those three and how the church centered her reform on those as we go through this session and the next. Now ultimately, no reform is complete or no reform really can become active in the, in the life of the church unless it is implemented. And we've seen this, and we, we've talked briefly about this in previous time periods with the ecumenical councils of the church. We can, the church can promulgate, or can, uh, councils can meet, and teachings can be derived from these councils and written down, documents written, promulgated by the Holy Father, but unless they're actually implemented, unless there is concrete actions to implement those decrees in the life of the church, then those documents really are somewhat meaningless. They have no, no backbone behind them. And we'll see here that the reform brought about in this authentic Catholic Reformation will be implemented primarily in three different ways, or through three vehicles, we should say. The first vehicle is through the Council of Trent. And so at the end of our session today, uh, tonight, today we will look at the Council of Trent, the decrees that were passed, and then how those decrees were implemented. The reform of the church was also implemented through the actions and activities of a great religious order that comes into the story of our church, a religious order that greatly influenced the church at this time and continues to exert a great influence over the church, although sometimes in the modern world not as sometimes good, sometimes bad, and heard this, uh, this influence that the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, influence and are able to, to bring about, but they play a very important role in the authentic reformation of the church. And also, as we've mentioned, as I mentioned in the beginning, just the act actions and activities of holy saints. This is, a, this is a great period of time where the Holy Spirit has brought forth numerous holy men and women, missionaries, martyrs, mystics, to help, uh, to help ensure that the church authentically reformed herself. So before we get into a discussion of the Council of Trent and the Jesuits and some of these other holy saints, we have to finish the story of what happened to the church in England. If you recall from our last session, when we talked about Henry VIII and how he made sure he had Parliament pass the Act of Supremacy so that he would be the supreme head of the church in England and not the Pope, we saw how, how he was able to do that, and there were certain great saints, St. Saint John Fisher, St. Thomas More, who upheld their understanding of the Catholic faith and their loyalty to the Holy Father, even to the point of their death. And so we left the story in England with Henry VIII dying and his young son, Edward VI, coming to the throne. So Edward VI was only nine years old when his father, Henry VIII, passed away. So there was a regency council in place for a while until he became of age to rule on his own. And really what happens in this period of time now, in this part of our story, is England goes from being in schism to now moving into heresy. We said earlier how King Henry VIII, when he made himself the head of the church in England, that was a schismatic act. He had not taken the Church of England into heresy, he had not begun to change any of the teachings of the church or have the church in England embrace heretical teachings. But in this time period, we see that happen, and it happens through the actions of one man in particular, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Now, Cranmer is the one who moves England from schism into heresy. Only seven months after Henry's death, Cranmer publishes a book of homilies. And in his book of homilies, he really gives notice of how of the teachings, the Protestant teachings that he embraces. He was really a secret Lutheran in heart. And so he begins to, in this book, he advocates justification by faith alone, that sola fide. It's only 